So let me know. Okay, welcome to Architects of Change Live, conversations with change makers who are moving humanity forward. These are all individuals I think that you would enjoy, that I think you will learn from and benefit from. And today, I'm so thrilled to be talking to my friend Lisa Genova, the author of Still Alice, uh, a fellow warrior in the Alzheimer's uh, fight. Uh, we're yep. totally devoted to each other and in this together and do a lot of stuff together, but she is... Uh, an incredible author, and she has a new book out. It's called Every Note Played. Look at Lisa Genova. Every Note Played, New York Times bestselling author of Still Alice, and uh, an incredible uh, woman. And this book is near and dear to her heart. Not only is it beautiful, but it involves another disease of the brain. Yeah. ALS and uh, it's very detailed about what ALS is much like you did with still Alice why another for most people depressing disease I know right <laughs> well I mean this is what I do I write stories about people living with neurological diseases and disorders and I do that because I think fiction is the way to move from sympathy to empathy. It's the way to it. understand what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. So while millions of us dumped buckets of ice water over our heads, right. I think most people then went and had lunch and continued on their lives. They are familiar with the letters ALS, but they might not really get what it feels like to live and die with that disease. And you detail really yeah. painstakingly what it's like to live with this disease. Describe it for the audience a little bit. Yeah, and, and actually I, I chose ALS next because Richard Glatzer, who yes. co-directed our film Still Alice, Correct. was diagnosed with ALS just before he read the book and then directed that film typing with one finger on an iPad. So that's um, a, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. but she jumped right in. The guy, that you got the impetus to write this by watching how difficult Richard's life was. Yeah. And, and it kind of went over the whole film, Still yeah. Alice. It was like a parallel. So this book mm -hmm. was almost giving birth as Still Alice, the film was being born. I know, I know. It's like I've had wow. so many sort of goosebump moments where it's like my book inspired their film, which then inspired this next book. Yes. Um, so yeah, so ALS is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that attacks our motor neurons. So our motor neurons, we have they start in the brain and they go to the spinal cord, and then from the spinal cord they go to all of your voluntary muscles, and they, they allow you to move. And so those neurons get attacked and die in this disease, and so eventually you become paralyzed, your entire body. So it can begin in your legs, it can begin in your hands, it can begin in your neck and head. So for Richard, his began in his neck and head, which I didn't know, I sort of always imagined someone with ALS automatically in a wheelchair to begin with. But he could walk fine, but I never heard the sound of his voice. So wherever it starts, it's a weakness, um, it can be muscle spasms, um, most people, 80% of people it begins in hands and feet. So and it's usually in your dominant hand. So if I go to work the key in the lock, I can't seem to have this, I have a weakness and can't seem to work it. Don't freak it. out if I all know. of a sudden you have like a weakness in your hand. Um, this right. is something you go to see a doctor about. So right, so most people think it's carpal tunnel or it's tendonitis or a pinched nerve, and usually it is. Okay. Um, with ALS, it doesn't resolve and it doesn't stay there, it moves. So the weakness in my hand would begin to move up to my forearm and then up to my shoulder. Um, it never stays still. So ev you eventually can't walk, can't, um, you can't feed yourself, you can't type anymore, you can't and we watch talk, that you with can't breathe. Richard. We watch that yeah. demise uh, throughout the filming of Still Alice and also then the opening of Still Alice and then his eventual um, passing. What did you want this book to do for Richard, mm. for this disease? Yeah, so I ca Richard was the first person I came to know with ALS and we talked about that I was going to write about this next and so we communicated by email. At that point he was typing with his big toe. Um, wow. I know. And so wow. I came to know I came to know twelve people with ALS really well in the course of doing the research for this book. Eight of them died before I finished the final draft. So part of what I want to do for Richard and the folks that I met is to is to in their honor portray what this experience, what this journey was like with dignity, with respect. Um, did they feel that people didn't understand it? Did they feel that this book 
would change the way people saw them suffering or appreciated yeah. them in life? I think that people with ALS, a couple things. Yes, I think most people with ALS are sort of, you get excluded from community just by the fact that you are, it's very difficult to move around Just with like ALS. Alzheimer's, you're, di you're uh, disconnected there's, from community, right? Absolutely, there's a lot of alienation and isolation that goes on. I think the media tends to portray this disease with the quote, heroes who don't let ALS beat them. So you have the Stephen Hawking's who just died recently. Right. Um, you have Pete Frady's who started the Ice Bucket Challenge. You have Steve Gleason, the, um, right. Saint, uh, the New Orleans Saints. Uh, football movie player. About him. Yeah. Yeah, and so when you see those guys, you know, they they require 24/7 ICU level care. That's we're not seeing that when we see the, them on TV. You know, we see them all buttoned up and 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 sort of all poised in in front of the camera and it looks sort of neat and tidy. This disease is not neat and tidy. So, yeah, I want to pull back the curtain and and sort of give the real humanity behind the letters the ALS and um, just why is it called know. every note played uh, so my my two main characters are pianists and there's a there was a line in the book where Richard uh, Richard the main character I named him after yeah. Richard um, he's playing and he's he's in love I'm just describing his love for music and piano and and when he, he he plays a note, I think his right hand is paralyzed at that point, so he plays it with his left hand and just sort of listens to the sound dissipate. And he says that every note played is a life and death. And it's the yeah. idea that every everything is temporary, everything comes and goes, and yeah. yet how do you want to live, what do you want to contribute, what's your purpose while that note is playing? What's yours? What's my purpose? Yeah. Oh gosh, Maria. Um, my purpose is to 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 be an ambassador for the vulnerable. Um, I want to, mm -hmm. yeah, I want to help the world move from a place of sympathy to empathy, um, to let, to bring people back into community who've been excluded because of diseases of the brain. And that's yeah. such, and Lisa does that so beautifully in this book, Every Note Played, and in Still Alice. Uh, takes people who are marginalized, who are alienated through no fault of their own, mm -hmm. and brings them out, not through sympathy, right? I think there's something, it's very different, yeah. sympathy and empathy, and we talk a lot, I talk a lot to my children about what the difference awesome. of yeah. those two things are. And so yeah. how do you describe the difference between sympathy? Because you're not looking for sympathy, you're looking for empathy. So. Yeah. How do you describe the difference, if that's yeah. your purpose? In basic terms, I think that sympathy is feeling for someone and empathy is feeling with. So sympathy, you know, when my grandmother had Alzheimer's, I really had a hard time getting to empathy with her. That's one of the reasons I wrote Still Alice. So I could feel bad for her, bad for us. This was you know, depressing and heartbreaking and frustrating and terrifying, but she was over there. Sympathy keeps a distance between you and the person. I think empathy collapses that distance. And so there's, there's no feeling bad for her, there's feeling with her. It's understanding and sort of walking in someone else's shoes and, and, and saying, yeah, I see you, I hear you, mm -hmm. like you exist, I get it, I'm here. And that's really what you're hoping this book does for those suffering from ALS and those caring. Yeah. And those caring, we talk a lot, as I said, we're very deeply involved in the Alzheimer's uh, fight and it's not just for the people who have Alzheimer's, but it's <clears throat> for the people who are doing the caregiving 24-7. Yeah. And we saw that in Richard's case as well. Yeah, so none of these diseases just happen to one person. Yes. There's the caregiving community the village around that person. And um, for every note played, I created a different story than I have in, in my previous books. I I had Richard's caregiver be his ex-wife. Yes. And they had a really bad divorce, and there's a lot of unresolved pain between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And I had this idea that while we can imagine ALS, you know, what, what it might be like to be increasingly paralyzed and trapped in your own body, mm -hmm. locked in and, and not able to walk and speak. And mm -hmm. how many of us are paralyzed in a different way emotionally? 
right. maybe stuck in the past, um, stuck in you know, blame or excuses or fear, not living the life you really want because you've got excuses wrapped around it. And so I thought these two with this very broken relationship and a lot left unsaid, again, here's a disease where you eventually can't communicate and that's yeah. horrifying to imagine. Right. But how many of us who don't have ALS, and I can tell you anything I want, do I say, I'm sorry, I forgive you, mm -hmm. I love you? Mm -hmm. So I thought that maybe these two would have you know, through, they end up under the same roof again. So she's taking care of him and it's, it's, um, it's really hard for the two of them to get to, the, the, the time is running out. This disease right. moves very quickly for most right. people. The average life expectancy after diagnosis is three years. And I saw so many people go in a year and a half while I was writing this book. Um, so that's fast. And so there's this, you know, that's a hyper-focused lens on, you, you, they don't have a lot of time to figure this out and maybe to come to some sense of healing. You know, we can't cure this disease, but right. where else in our human being right. might we find healing? Um, and then I thought, well, all of us don't have a lot of time. You know, yeah. if I get to live to be 48 or 80, it's not a lot of time. Right. So get to it now. So there was that sort of message in the book, I too. love that. Get to the healing now because yeah. uh, now is all we have. And there's always healing that needs to be done in every relationship. That's something I myself have learned. And, yeah. uh, and um, there's always, I like that you're saying, I like that you did that because there's always stuff that's left unsaid. There's always things that people feel they can't find their voice in whatever right. situation so you you that was very clever Thank uh, you. <laughs> to put that in there the book is called every note played Lisa also we put in the Sunday paper uh, when she went up to Ted to give her talk uh, on Alzheimer's you're going back to give a talk on failure what are you going to tell us about failure that we need to know <laughs> so the talk it's called how three questions two failures and an idea changed my life so the, I, the idea behind the talk is that I, how old was I? I was 33 when I was divorced for mm -hmm. the first time. I've been divorced twice. Um, and, I, and I framed that as failure. And I really, at the time I was, I was heartbroken, unemployed and divorced and a single mom to a four year old. And I just, I couldn't imagine what my life was gonna look like next. And originally mm -hmm. that sort of sunk me into a really dark hole. Mm -hmm. but then the question the tone of that question changed and it became a curiosity and a possibility and out of that came if I could do anything I wanted yeah and if I didn't care have to care about what anyone thought of me what might I do and the answer was write the novel I had had that idea for a right, right. novel about a woman with Alzheimer's told from her perspective sold it out of her car I did shopped it one person at a time. And the reason I did that was the second failure is because I finished this book and I sent out a hundred query letters to literary agents and nobody would represent it or publish it. So it was really another dead end. Only that time I really didn't frame it as failure. I framed it as more of a detour than a dead end. And it was like, well, I'll go self-publish it then. And I sold it out of the trunk of my car. So are you trying to get people to take failure and reframe it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so failure is just a word that we put in our mind and then we assign it to a, an experience in our lives and your 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 thoughts create your reality. So your, if I'm going to think this is failure and that's the end of that, then that's my reality. But if I think okay, there must be another way to do this, what could it be? Then that's my reality and I keep going. And yeah. that's how you frame your whole life now as yeah. is. Yeah, absolutely. And does it yeah. scare you to go do a TED talk? A little, yeah. It's different than something like this. Right. Um, yes. You know, I love you, and this feels friendly <laughs> and wonderful. But it's um, there's there's no teleprompter, and there's no you have to met like you have to know your talk cold. And this one in particular, the slides are going to be auto advancing, so I have to be on with how those slides are ticking off. Otherwise, we'll we'll be you know off. And it'll do you be think weird. about failure going to give a TED talk? <laughs> I was really terrified last time for the one about how to prevent Alzheimer's. Uh, I just hadn't done it before, and it was, you know, you know, Al, the year I went, it was last year. It was Al Gore, the Pope, uh, Serena Williams, and it was just sort of and like, Lisa Genova. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But so, you had to push through. I did, yeah, and it was, you know, what got me through what? was was getting back to what is my intention. 
get it off me. Yeah. It was stop worrying about me and am I going to fail and is this going to be embarrassing and, and how do I look and da da da. It was no, my intention is to teach people about how they can get some control over their brain health, how they can prevent Alzheimer's, give them something that they can use. And it now it's to get, uh, get people, give them some control over their thoughts and how they can frame their experiences. Yeah, and that really anything is possible. What do you want to do? Like I think, you know, for a lot of people, they're like in this book, yeah, with, no, with the character Karina, yeah, it's, you know, she didn't allow herself to live the life she wanted and she blamed her husband. And she just sort of stayed stuck and trapped in that place of, I can't, I can't. And so for people who might be stuck in, in the I shoulds and I can't because and yeah, but, yeah. Um, maybe it will unlock some folks and allow them to think, well, what, what would I do if I could do anything I wanted? And so go do what you want, yeah. Go do what you want. Every note played. Lisa Genova, you can buy it now, get it on Amazon. And you can also watch her TED Talk about failure. You can still buy Still Alice and you can actually go see, you can still see the movie. So a lot of her work, a lot of her thoughts, a lot of her brain activity out there in the atmosphere trying to take us from sympathy to empathy, trying to pull the curtain back on failure, on Alzheimer's, on ALS, on the life experience. Lisa Genova, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Oh, awesome. You're